it's been a fantastic conversation. I I I, I found it really interesting. I, I I could carry on talking you to for, to you for a long time because there's stuff that I want to argue with you about. <laughs> but I think that we're in we're in a huge amount of agreement on a lot of stuff. Fascinating. You know what? I would I would be interested, and you can cut this however you want. What would be those things? Because I, I find that I grow in my own understanding when people do like push back. So if there's something maybe in this conversation or maybe in your notes that say, you know what, I really want to challenge this one thing. Let's do it. You decide if you want to keep it or not. I do have a bit more time. So unless you have a hard okay, stop, cool. so, only for a few minutes. So, so, so this this is one of those problems that 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 I I, I can see the challenges for. But one of one of the one of the things that I, I, I you said your Google and your you know you're running the software for the world, so you can't be too opinionated about what it is. I, I, I buy that. I understand. I understand that. But there's also this thing of raising the that level of abstraction, the step by step. It's how we make progress. It's it's what Kubernetes did. It's what operating systems did. When I first started, the, the generation of operating systems that I started with, if you wanted to print something, you had to write in Assembler the code to talk to your specific printer. You know, the idea of printer drivers was a radical concept <laughs> and a cool one when it came along. So so th that incremental stepwise improvement in abstraction seems important. And one of the things that one of the nicest big system that I've ever seen was the exchange that we built when we built the exchange at Elmex. And it had lots of nice properties and some of them were, you know, had complicated and so on. But, but one of the things that it strikes me is, and I'm always on the fence about this, is that there seem to be different groups of programmers. And I feel bad saying this, but it feels to me that there are the programmers that are assembling the high level pieces. And there are people like you that are building the plumbing, the, 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 the technical things that facilitate that assembly of the high level pieces. And I wonder, where there are there are better ways of abstracting the problem so that you can do more of that job of the plumbing by just make it making the programming model a little bit more abstractive. The key idea that I'm talking about here from my experience is the difference between synchronous and asynchronous systems. I think that asynchronous systems are much closer to the truth of the universe and tr much closer to the truth of um uh, software fundamentally and that synchrony is kind of this artificial slightly weird thing when you stop and pay attention to it um, way of interacting with systems and if you start my belief is that if you start to use asynchrony as assume believe adopt asynchrony as kind of an, an overarching approach it gives you the ability to do to put much hide more much more of the accidental complexity of the system away from the core of the system that's actually doing interesting things and that's it that the, the, the most we we built our exchange like that our exchange we, we essentially built some kind of a custom service mesh which was ridiculously blisteringly high performance and did clustering and fault tolerance and security and a lot of the services that you talked talked about we we had in in uh, in that but the actual services themselves were single threaded and almost like pure domain driven design domain models they they were stateful where we needed them to be stateful and and not in, in other circumstances and it was the not it reminded me of going back to programming when i was young and just learning where it was all everything looked simple <laughs> it was a beautiful way of building systems even these complicated distributed ultra high performance systems one of the ideas that i came across and one of the things i was wondering about whether we would one of the routes that we would take when we were talking about the serverless thing is i've heard people talking about stateful serverless and I've wondered about whether that's a route to something simple. The other model that what I'm talking about is related to. So, so we did we did a thing called the reactive manifesto off the back of the exchange and talking about building re reactive systems, event based systems, but you know, plus plus. Um, and um, 
one of the ideas, state for serverless seems to me to be an opportunity for infrastructure providers like Google and others to be able to raise that bar a little further in terms of pro provide a programming model that allows you to focus primarily on the problem domain and that you do all of the work of, you know, clustering and concurrency and you know managing those things separately and elsewhere and, and scalability. And I think that's per that's possible. And I, I was just wondering whether that was a route that our conversation could go in. And the, the other thing, the other, the, the other, you asked me to mention the things that I would challenge you on a little bit. Is I think we can take determinism further. So, so the reason that there are there are, as far as I can see, there's only two, maybe one and a half reasons why our systems aren't deterministic. So one of them is concurrency. That's the biggie. When we, as soon as our systems concurrent, they're no longer deterministic. So we can manage concurrency at the margins of our system in the appropriate places and limit its impact. And the other one is. Um, you know, where we consciously inject some some random feature, you know, some 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 random randomness into our algorithms. And I think that architecting to try and limit the boundaries of the non-determinism of our systems is a very healthy way to get to more testable, higher quality systems. So those, so those are the things I that think, I would be I think, interesting in kind of having a deeper conversation with you sometimes. Let's walk through some of those. Like when I learned Haskell for the first time, their philosophy around functional based programming had a lot of those tenets. And there's always one thing. You could do that in your own isolated view of the world on your own one box with a single thread. You can do that. But then we have this thing called the network, which is mm -hmm. all of those non-deterministic things. That's the network, period. Mm -hmm. That's how networks work. There will be collisions. There will be retries. Things will come and go. You can't predict that. And so no matter what we do at the app level, the moment we have to interact with something elsewhere, then it all comes back. You can pick whatever model for the app. You still have to deal with this other world. That's it. And so unless someone figures that out, that's just the nature of the world. It is. So it's like, where do you put it? Right. We know the network is not going to be reliable 100% of the time. That is a guarantee. Mm -hmm. And so now we have things like load balancers where we try to isolate this. They do all the retry logic. They try to smooth over these rough edges so we can keep that logic out of the app. So the app just assumes a simple world and we put the reality in the load balancer. Maybe you put the, la the, re uh, the reality in the VPC. So cloud providers do a lot of this at the low levels. A lot of people just feel that, oh, I'm just calling this IP. But a lot of this is actually happening for the messy world of networking in that VPC to make sure your packets actually make it to the other side and come back. So I think a lot of these things are already hidden from a lot yeah. of people. They're, they're already there. I mean, if you think about managed databases, in many ways, that's what they're doing. Like Cloud Spanner, which is a multi-region SQL database with strong consistency. You just, as a developer, you say insert into, you have no idea that that data is being replicated, being sharded for performance. It's doing yeah. all of this hard stuff, dealing with time and consistency. And we have to have trade-offs, right? There's a such thing as speed of light. And so systems like Spanner say, well, look, the upper bound of consistency is seven milliseconds. So as a developer, you know, if you just wait seven milliseconds, things will have a total ordering that you can count on. And therefore you can just focus on inserting and retrieving data. And the libraries tend to work out this seven millisecond thing on your behalf. So I think we have a lot of these components, but I think the thing that makes a lot of this stuff really complicated is that, and I think we want this as humans, as much as we want this standardization, as much as we want to take away some of this complexity, the beautiful thing about our world, like I'm into hip hop, it's a great genre of music, but it comes from people who, a lot of people who may not have had the full discipline of what music is. Maybe they can't even read music, but when you hear it, you're like, wow, if they would have followed the rules, it would never have existed. And I think a lot of the people who we've invited to build things, they're going to start with the canvas we give them. Some people are going to start with Next.js. Some people are going to start with Python. And given those canvases, they're just going to create things. And I think it's on us as builder of the frameworks, builder of the libraries, to take all the stuff that you've talked about. I mean, the reason why I love Go is because it's like the first programming language that actually took the best of concurrency 
and let me keep the simplicity of synchrony, right? I can just say, call this, call that. And under the hood, Go was working out the true world of things can happen in parallel, things can happen in a concurrent manner. But for me, in my code base, I wasn't articulating all of those things. I was just taking traffic and passing it to the right handler, and Go did all the right things on the back end. And I think we can do that. And I think it's going to come into the forms of libraries and frameworks. Cloud providers are also trying to do this at the different protocols. So I do like this idea that if we can come up with really good protocols that allow you to do the thing you want to do, and the implementation of those protocols may deal with the real world complexity of all the things we just talked about. And for the large part, I think that's what cloud is. And last thing I'll say here is, the thing that makes cloud hard, because you remember when Google Cloud came out, we only had one service, App Engine. Mm -hmm. And it was a PaaS, and we had one cache, we had one data store, and the idea is that we've extracted all of this hard global Google infrastructure. Just write App Engine apps, and you don't have to think about any of this stuff. And the world, like the people who pay money for stuff, they're like, <laughs> nope, we want protocols <laughs> like Linux. We want protocols like SQL. We want all the things that we're used to because we didn't just start building software today. We have existing software that we would like to move in this world. So now as a cloud provider, we have to approach, we've chosen, we don't have to, we've chosen to approach this with the whole spectrum in mind. Sure. So, 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 so that so, one more challenge to to, to that. I, I I buy what you're saying entirely, but 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 just one one more challenge to that, which is which is that it seemed to me that the serverless thing was an opportunity. The, the serverless thing. I, I, we, we, we talked about this in a slightly different way. When I said about it changing the economics of software development, what I really meant was that we ch we change from cost per byte to cost per CPU cycle. That, that That's fundamentally what seems to me that serverless does. And, and that changes the way that we should think about data, how we store it. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe normalization is a stupid idea because CPU is more expensive than, than storage. You know, those sorts of ideas. So so that that gives us an opportunity to just think a little bit differently and have a slightly different model for distributed computing. And uh, the, the, the next step for me that would make sense to that is to give the illusion of this kind of stateful serverless model where effectively you're building actors. And then that gives you an opportunity to do a whole bunch of smarter things in the background, you know, configurable, you know, you know, not not just the same same shape for everybody, but it allows people to focus more on the problem that they're solving and less on the tech that they're using to solve it with. But I think the key here is that experience dominates all of that. GitHub yes. is a monolith bit built in Ruby on Rails that ignores all of that, yeah. right? And just says, but you have GitHub and it's number one from an experience standpoint. Yes. And I think the biggest challenge we've seen in our industry is there are people who build really good new patterns, new... The biggest challenge is adoption. Yes.